Good afternoon and happy Sabbath. I'm Bernard and I'd like to welcome you to Bethany's online worship experience. Whether you're joining us for the very first time or you're one of our members, we pray that you'll take this time to put aside all of the distractions of the past week and focus on Jesus. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us today to do what we're called to do every day as Christians, which is to worship the Lord. We invite you to praise him as you would if you were here in person together sing and praise however you choose. Please remember to share this worship experience with friends and family, and be sure to follow us on all social media platforms. And remember, you don't have to be at Bethany to be with Bethany. Have a happy Sabbath. Good afternoon. My name is Pastor Reginald Guerrier, and I'd like to wish you a wonderful and amazing Memorial Day Sabbath. Now, as you're preparing to meet with your family members and friends, perhaps for a meal or barbecue, we believe that you have chosen the right place to be on this Sabbath. We're going to share the word together. We're going to sing together, pray together, and most of all, usher in the Holy Spirit into our homes and into our hearts. Now, before this service continues, I just have a few things that I would like to share with you about what God is doing for us right here at Bethany SDA. On July 10th, I'd like to invite all of you and your family members and friends as this church takes a significant step towards moving past the COVID-19 pandemic. That's right, we will have our first live stream service right here in this sanctuary and you do not want to miss this it's going to be a spectacular event as god once again hosts us in this building as we worship and praise his name see you there and then on saturday july 10th during the month of june as we look forward to celebrating father's day and acknowledging our fathers we'd like to commit the entire month to celebrating and affirming our men. Now we know that it was the arms of Almighty God Himself who led us through this pandemic, but where would we be had it not been for the strength, the resilience, the prayers, and the commitment of the men around us? During that month, I also want to preach a sermon series that I've entitled, Diary of a Praying Man. I will share with us, men, three prayers that every man should have in his arsenal. Join us for the month of June as we affirm the pillars, the men in our communities. And speaking of strength and resilience, no one has been more relentless and reliable in protecting and providing for us like God himself. Each and every day, your needs and my needs are taken care of. And he asks that we simply remain faithful with our tithes and our offerings. Let us put our trust in him one more time by remitting a faithful tithe and offering. See the description box as to how you can electronically do so. And we look forward to God partnering with our faithfulness, not only to bless us, but to bless others, not only in our community, but communities abroad. Today, as we conclude our series in congratulating and appreciating the wonderful women that God has placed around us, I'm happy to announce our special guest speaker, Dr. Shauna K. Denham Wilkes. Dr. Denham Wilkes is the former Associate Unit Chief of the Child Inpatient Psychiatric Unit at the Kings County Hospital Center. She received her bachelor's degree from NYU and also her doctorate in clinical psychology from St. John's University. Dr. Denham Wilkes is married to Pastor Courtney Wilkes, and together they have the pleasure of raising their bundle of joy, the precocious Caleb Wilkes. You can follow Dr. Denham Wilkes on most social media platforms. And today, as we not only celebrate our women, but also in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month, we are happy to have Dr. Shauna K. Denham Wilkes. See you very soon and enjoy the rest of this worship experience.
Sabbath church family. This is prayer time. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. What a beautiful reminder that we can take our hardships, our troubles to the Lord. Whatever it is that we are going through, rather than bearing it alone, rather taking the Lord ourselves and allow it to cripple us, we can take it immediately to the Lord in prayer, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for us. What a beautiful promise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come to you today in prayer. We thank you for everything you have done for us. We thank you for another week. You have been our protector, our healer. In spite of our faults and our transgressions, you continue to guide us to protect us, to protect our children, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We know that it is by your grace that you have given us another Sabbath to praise you and worship you. We didn't know what the week would bring us, but you took control of it. You took control of our lives. You guided us, and we want to say thank you. We thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, Lord. Father God, we come to you this morning with our brokenness and humility to ask for, for, for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the spirit of your word that says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. You will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we come to you with a broken spirit and a contrite heart and confess our sins to you. I ask, Lord, that you bless those who join us today. As we come together today to praise you and worship you on this Sabbath morning, we also bring our concerns. We bring our daily struggles. We bring with us our situations, our difficult situations. We bring with us our disappointments, our sadness, our financial challenges, our families, Lord. And we are so thankful that we can come and place them at the foot of your cross. We thank you that you are near to all who call on you. Thank you for the ultimate sacrifice of your son Jesus, for his blood that washes us as white as snow. We ask for your Holy Spirit to give us guidance and strength and help us to resist any temptation that may come our way as a result of our desire. I ask, Lord, that you be with all those who are sick, all those who need a special touch from you, Lord. I ask, I ask that you fill us with your love, because your love is the perfect love that can chase away all fear. With your love, Father God, we know that we can do all things to Christ who strengthens us, Father God. I ask that you fill us with your spirit, so we can stand tall to represent you in everything that you do. I ask, Lord, that you bless each and everyone on every platform watching this program this morning. I ask that you give us a spirit of discernment to stand against the enemy's temptation and the, the, the traps, Lord. I know that nothing escapes your sight, so I ask for your guidance for each and every one of us representing our families. I thank you, Lord, for being a healing God. Thank you that you hear and answer our prayers, Lord. The, the, your word says that you will meet all our needs according to the riches of your glory in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I ask that you look on our physical, our our emotional and our spiritual need today on this Sabbath morning, Lord. And I ask that you reach out on each and every one of us who needs a special touch from you. 
I pray a special, especially for the speaker of the hour today. I ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be with him and guide him and the word of his mouth can be a blessing to each and every one of us. I ask Lord to, um, to bring us together as we are meant to be. Give us unity, Lord, as a church family. Lord, I ask, I ask that you help us to grow stronger as we fulfill the destiny that you have laid out for us, Lord. Grant our family forgiveness for any sins that we have committed, Lord, and help us to continue to be the Christians that you want us to be. I ask that you fill us with your love, fill us with your grace, Fill us with your spirit, Lord, and may this worship service be a blessing for each of us listening this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, church family. Welcome to another worship service. We just invite you to worship with us this morning. Stand up on your feet. How many of you know that our God is greater? How many of you know that our God reigns? Above everything, our God reigns. And so stand up, sing this song with us, because our God is a good God. Amen.
Thank you very much, Pastor Garrier and the membership here at the lovely Bethany Church. It's my privilege to be back with you and to be with you to spend some time together on this mental health Sabbath. When we think about mental health, we think so many things and thoughts, but today I want to talk about the ministry of destigmatization. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. In Jesus' name, amen. The story is told of a man who encountered Jesus under some very in unusual circumstances. If you turn with me in your Bible to the book of Mark, chapter 5, here we'll find this account that is so vividly laid out in the scriptural text. The Bible tells us they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. The Ministry of Destigmatization. May is Mental Health Month which has been observed in the United States of America since 1949. Yet 72 years later in 2021, we still have a long way to go to stop the stigma against mental illness. The COVID-19 pandemic and the outcry against racial injustices brought many of us to a reckoning with our own mental health. 
the number of new and first time cases of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, adolescent suicide attempts, and substance use disorders has skyrocketed. And in this challenging time, resources to address these concerns have been taxed to the limit. We see a priority in our society placed on physical well-being, magazines with people in peak physical condition, diets, and many other social messages are sent out concerning our physical well-being. We are encouraged to know our numbers, such as our BMI, our A1C, our blood pressure, etc. We have been focusing on physical well-being for many, many years and in many, many forums. But the mind and the body work in close relationship with each other to carry out tasks as simple as taking a selfie to as complicated as doing neurosurgery. Based on the concept of the whole person whose sum is greater than the function of any one part, there should be no discussion of health without a discussion of mental health. No doctor's appointment, no therapy session, no pastoral counseling should neglect one in light of the other. You see, you can be in peak physical shape, the best shape of your life physically, but if your mental health is suffering, your overall health is bound to be affected. So if we do not hear a health message that is as much associated with a direct and comprehensive approach to mental health as it is with the encouragement of the importance of vegetarianism, we have to ask ourselves, is our denominational health message well-rounded enough? Very few people are able to truly to even define mental health or mental illness, in my experience. Third John 2 states, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thou, thy soul prospereth. And that is the wish of God for each and every one of us. Those are the thoughts that he thinks towards us. So when we say mental health, what is mental health? What does it mean to be mentally healthy? The American Psychological Association defines mental health in the following way. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we can handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. Mental health is important at every stage of life, from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. So based on this definition of mental health, how would you assess your mental health today? Do you know your mental health numbers? Now let's take a look at mental illness. What is mental illness? Again, the APA defines mental illness as a condition that impacts a person's thinking, feeling, or mood and may affect his or her ability to relate to others and function on a daily basis. Let me just encourage you though that when you've met one person who is experiencing a mental illness or a mental health condition, you've met exactly one person who's experiencing mental illness or a mental health condition. You see, each person who is experiencing a mental health condition or mental illness will have different experiences unique to them, even people with the same diagnosis. A mental health condition isn't the result of one event. Research suggests multiple 
interlinking causes such as genetics, environment, and lifestyle, they all play a factor and combine to influence whether someone develops a mental health condition or not. Think about everything that we experienced in 2020 related to the COVID-19 pandemic. There's very few persons whose mental health was not challenged as we lived with coping with lockdown, as we lived with coping with restricted conditions, the illness itself and the fallout as it affected many of us impacted our ability to cope in many ways. Persons were impacted with their ability to sleep, to get restful sleep including for many persons, mood changes, or even difficulties maintaining optimal weight. Mental health conditions are impacted by what happens in us and what happens to us. A stressful job or home life makes some people more susceptible, as do traumatic life events like being the victim of a crime. Biochemical processes and circuits as well as basic brain structures may play a role too in mental health conditions and mental illness. The statistics are staggering. One in five adults experiences a mental health condition every year. One in 20 live with a serious mental illness such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder type one or two. In addition to the person who's directly experiencing a mental illness, family members, friends, and communities are also impacted and affected. 50% of mental health conditions begin by age 14, and 75% of mental health conditions develop by the age of 24. These statistics are staggering, and truth be told, despite our relationship with Jesus, Jesus, Christian believers, we ourselves are not exempt. Since corrupting one-third of the angels in heaven, and even here on earth in the Garden of Eden, the devil has been attacking us, particularly on the battlefield of our minds. Adam and Eve were created to live forever, yet Genesis 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Remember, up until that point, Eve had known only perfect health, not just of herself and Adam, but the perfect health of every living thing around her. She had seen no rotting food, no wilting leaves, no dying relatives. The concept of illness was not a reality for her because it was never intended to be. She had no clue about vitamins, wrinkle creams, mood swings, retirement plans, life insurance, insomnia, or funeral homes. In Genesis 2 verse 7, the original text tells us that young Yahweh God formed man of the dust of, gro of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and be man became a living soul. But the instant that Eve and Adam were disobedient to God and listened to the enemy, health became an attribute with the potential and likelihood of instability, deterioration, and illness. Our human mind is one of God's amazing creation. And when you learn that your brain has the capacity to have more ideas than the number of atoms in the known universe, you can grasp that our minds are extremely valuable real estate and you can understand the importance of our minds when it comes to the great controversy and spiritual warfare.
Right now, there are 100 billion neurons in your brain, transmitting messages from one neuron to the other at speeds of 248 miles an hour. And we are here to debunk the myth that you only use a percentage of your brain. Your entire brain is called into service and into action in order to help you and I to function every single day, all day long. Although the statistics indicate that more and more people have had periods of time where their mental health has been affected, despite the fact that we know that the battlefield of our mind is a major front in the great controversy, many refuse to acknowledge that issues of mental illness, mental health conditions are real and could even impact themselves or someone they know. Even within our faith community, there is strong stigma against mental health conditions. There are more than a few loud voices who continue to say that mental illness is the measure of someone's Christianity. Or as someone posted on my social media page in response to something that I had posted about mental health. And I quote, this person wrote, having a mental illness is the evidence of a person's lack of victory over sin. Nothing could be further from the truth. But when I, as a Christian, hear those kinds of comments from within the faith community, why would Christians feel comfortable if they are dealing with postpartum depression or schizophrenia or panic attacks or bipolar disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder? Why would they want to publicly acknowledge this if our faith communities are are continuing to persist in stigmatizing mental health conditions and are not deemed to be psychologically safe spaces for this kind of transparency? Why would persons experiencing mental health conditions request specific prayer specific to their illness or even offer a testimony that would make them vulnerable within the household of faith? People with cancer receive our sympathy, while people with depression are left isolated and hopeless because they're concerned about receiving our judgment, and that's just wrong. Especially when evidence of the impact of mental health conditions are noted right in the sacred text. Jeremiah was depressed. Job and his wife had post-traumatic stress disorder. Hannah was anxious. Saul had, had bipolar disorder with psychotic features. And the man named Legion had symptoms that are commonly associated with schizophrenia and was a cutter. Mental illness is real, my friends, but above all, remember that God desires that we would be in good health and prosper. We are in a crisis in our faith community when it comes to mental health, primarily because it is an area that is so poorly understood. Despite the fact that many people do not fully understand what mental illness is, it is one of those topics where many people believe that they know how to treat it better than mental health professionals. And even going to see the psychotherapist, even going to see the psychiatrist is met with concern and sometimes derision within the household of faith. But I ask you, my brothers and sisters, when someone has significant problems, with their teeth? Do we take out a pair of pliers and a bottle of overproof or do we encourage them to go to the dentist to get their issue taken care of by a subject matter expert? When someone breaks their arm, do we make them a cup of bush tea and tell them to lay down or do we make sure that they get to the proper medical care so that their condition can be addressed in a timely manner to increase the likelihood of full recovery? When someone has a significant problem with their mental health, do we tell them to just get over it or do we support them in seeking out a licensed, trained clinician? My brothers and sisters,
This is so important. I believe that overall we are compassionate people who do not wish to see anyone suffer. In fact, I know this because we open our doors to offer a fulfilling and therapeutic worship experience to our local community and our online viewers. We run vibrant and successful food pantries serving hundreds of people on a weekly basis who we visit the sick. We we pray for those who are shut in. We visit those who are incarcerated. We do a world of good, yet there are still too many people in the household of faith who when confronted by family mem with family members, colleagues, or fellow congregants who may be experiencing failing mental health, their response is, I'll pray for you. Are you familiar with the I'll pray for you technique? It's when someone tells their actual you their actual concern, when someone tells us their actual concern and we say, I'll pray for you. And that was the prayer. I want to send a shout out to those of you who actually pray with or for the person when you say to them, I will pray for you. So is there anything wrong with telling people dealing with mental illness to pray? Absolutely not. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks heaven's storehouse. We cry out to the Lord with our voice, but Jesus came to set the captives free from whatever problem we may face. He restored the mental and emotional health of so many people during his earthly ministry. He knows what it is to experience every concern that we go through. He himself experienced mental anguish in the garden of Gethsemane as the burden of sin weighed heavily upon him. Jesus wants you to have the peace of mind that is part of perfect peace and he will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Prayer is powerful but we as a faith community can do so much more to address mental health stigma. It's what I call the ministry of destigmatization. You see, stigma says you're a disgrace, but destigmatization says my grace is sufficient for you. Stigma says suffer in silence, but destigmatization says I will never leave you or forsake you. Stigma calls out the spirit of shame, but destigmatization came to set the captives free and to move us beyond shame, blame, judgment, and condemnation. Stigma sees weakness, but Jesus in his ministry of destigmatization teaches us that in our weakness, we are made perfect when we unite with his strength. Stigma sees punishment and rejection. But the ministry of destigmatization sees liberation and restoration. Here are three key don'ts when it comes to the ministry of destigmatization. Do not isolate or ignore people with mental illness. The man in Mark 5 was so afflicted that he was unable to be in society. In fact, Jesus encounters him in double ostracization. He is ostracized from his home and also from the community where Jesus encountered him. Number two, don't intervene in an ineffective or abusive manner. The man in Mark 5 had been repeatedly chained hand and foot, but this did not result in increased safety for him. In fact, the Bible reports that he was in such anguish that he cried out and cut himself, evidence of challenges with coping and receiving appropriate care. Don't write people with mental illness off as untreatable or uncurable. Jesus healed the man formerly known as Legion and seeing him as healed should have caused rejoicing, but instead it caused fear and disbelief. But the proper treatment intervention can be so helpful in addressing mental health conditions. So stay hopeful, seek the right help for as long as there is life, there is hope. Jesus came to show us a better way and he is our ultimate example of how to exhibit the ministry of destigmatization.
Jesus recognized the humanity obscured by the mental illness. He says to the man, he says, what is your name? He recognizes him as a person with a name, with an identity, and he wanted to let him know that he recognized who he could be and who he was despite his affliction. Jesus was realistic about the need for intervention. The situation was dire. The man's illness had been protracted, resulting in physical and mental injury. And if left untreated, it would have cost this man his life. So Jesus acted to get the man the mental health first aid that he needed in order to bring about a restored condition. Jesus not only did these things, but he also established hope. And the Bible tells us that when we establish hope among those around us who are in desperate need of hope, that they will know that we are Christians by our love, by the demonstration that we understand that in Jesus Christ, there is neither Jew or Gentile, neither male nor female, neither bond nor free, because at the foot of the cross, we are all equal and we are all in need of the salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus treated everyone with dignity and the man called formerly known as Legion was no exception. When those came to see for their own eyes what had Jesus had done because of what they had heard, they found the man healed, clean, and clothed. Jesus recognized that when we end suffering, we restore dignity. Jesus saw the man as a disciple, regardless of his past, regardless of his affliction. He understood that Every single person has a part to play and that this man had a part to play in worship, in witnessing, and was a valuable instrument for Christian service. And he was as much a minister as anyone else. We all have a part to play. Mental health crises could impact any one of us and those who have been impacted by major depression, addiction, postpartum depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, anxiety, panic attacks, schizophrenia, need worship communities that are equipped with compassion and have zero tolerance for stigmatization. Our Jesus specializes in destigmatization. He defied the legalistic judgment mental hypocrites of his day to heal the disabled, the lepers, the tax collectors, the adulterers, the mentally ill. And he took on the ultimate stigma of sin by dying the death of the cross to set each and every one of us free. There is therefore now no stigma to them who are in Christ Jesus. And we honor the mission of Christ when we do as he did. So let's commit to the ministry of destigmatization and embrace everyone in our community and make the household of faith a psychologically safe space to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us and for showing us how we can live as Jesus lived. And we ask for each person who is hearing this message that we would allow the mind of Christ to be in us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to this end. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath, everybody. I hope that you were blessed by the message that was preached by God's woman servant, Dr. Shauna K. Denham Wilkes. And for this segment of Let's Connect, as we honor and celebrate Mental Health Awareness Month, I've come to ask you for a small yet impactful favor. Now, this message is not sponsored by the Bethany Seventh-day Adventist Church, but I would like to ask you if you feel so impressed to do something. 
Recently, I've had an opportunity to meet with Senator Kaplan, and we know that some of our uh, men and women who suffer with mental health, severe mental health illnesses, and are often forgotten, well, they are found in our prison system. And when we look throughout the Bible, Jesus, during the early parts of his ministry, he visited John the Baptist in prison. Also later in the ministry, undoubtedly, Jesus spent some time in prison. And when he was on the cross, the last person he interacted with before he died was a convicted criminal who even claimed his guilt. Here's what I'd like for us to do. There are two bills that will be placed before the New York legislator sometime soon. The elder parole bill and also the fair and timely parole bill. These are bills that are meant to allow individuals who have done their time, perhaps they're seniors or, or those who have proven themselves to have uh, uh, taken the time and the effort to rehabilitate themselves while in prison. We want to give them a fair opportunity to see a parole board. So here's how you can help. If you feel impressed, please call Senator Kaplan at the number below. Let her know that you support these two bills, the elder parole bill and also the fair and timely parole bill. So that as Jesus admonished us to do in the book of Matthew, our brothers and sisters who are in prison, we're coming to visit them. Not only will we pray with them or pray for them, but we also want to visit them and allow uh, them to be impacted by our efforts and our passion to see that they get parole justice, those who are deserving of it. So if you feel impressed, call the number below and let Senator Kaplan's office know that you support these two very important bills. Thank you for connecting with me today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and I will see you next Sabbath as we celebrate and honor our men with the series that I've entitled The Diary of a Praying Man. Three prayers that every man should know or every man should have in his arsenal. See you next Sabbath. Enjoy your weekend.